Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon texts for today, this festival of St. Michael and all angels, are selected verses from our Gospel lesson, from Matthew chapter 18, and please rise as we hear these words again in Jesus' name. <coughs> At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it will be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father, who is in heaven. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. You may be seated. It is perfectly normal to want to know how we compare to other people. But just because something is normal does not mean it is always right. It is certainly no sin to be aware of the fact that you have beaten someone in a game, or that you were able to get a job or a roster spot on a sports team or in a play by doing better than someone else in an audition. There is no sin in this. But as we are shown in the opening verses of our gospel lesson for today, it is not befitting a Christian to want to know how we compare to others in the Christian church. We would have to admit that compared to how we normally think and act, the disciples were not acting all that strangely when they asked Jesus which of them was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But they should not have asked Jesus this question. They shouldn't even have been thinking it. They, like us and all believers from all times, should never let ourselves wander into thinking that maybe there is something about us that sets us apart, or something about us that somehow makes us more appealing to God. The fact that the disciples had allowed themselves to wander into this way of thinking is but one of many reminders that we have that the Bible is not a book about perfect people. Instead, it is a perfect book about very flawed individuals. And this is also true for God's church on earth. It is comprised of God's saints, those whom God sees as perfect. But God does not see us this way because we ourselves are perfect. Rather, God sees us through faith in Jesus as our Savior, the faith which he has given us and through which he forgives us of all our sins. It is on this basis, the basis of Jesus, that God has made us his beloved children, about whom he cares. This is why we are important to God. It's because he has made us his children. And because we are important to God, he sees to our well-being in both our bodies and our souls. Now when Jesus' disciples asked him which of them was the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus replied by setting a child in the middle of them and saying that whoever would humble themselves like this child would be the greatest. But why did Jesus answer their question, by saying this. Well, to answer that, we need to look at some of the common characteristical differences between children, especially little children, and adults. Little kids know that they need to rely on their parents for pretty much everything. While adults, on the other hand, are usually pretty well confirmed in their ability to take care of themselves. Little kids trust their parents. And if their parents tell them something, even if it's something they don't completely understand, they're going to believe it. Adults, on the other hand, seem to think that they usually have things pretty, fi pretty figured out pretty well for themselves already, that they know everything. And finally, little kids have a pretty easy time figuring out that there definitely is danger in this world. Maybe they don't know this right away, but after a few scuffed needs and the onset of stranger danger, little kids learn that it is definitely in their best interest to stay pretty close to their parents. While adults so often think that they can do whatever and go wherever they want, 
without even recognizing or caring about possible dangers. To sum it all up, little kids know that they are not the biggest and strongest and smartest beings in the universe. They know that they're actually pretty weak and that they need to rely on their parents to take care of them and tell them what they should do and not do. Adults, on the other hand, have a much easier time thinking that they are pretty great and smart and that they can take care of themselves without having to rely on anyone or anything else in the world. So how do these common mindsets of children and adults line up with the Christian faith? The answer is that we need to become like children to be God's children. We need to see that we are not strong, but that we are flawed, weak individuals who really have no idea what is best for us. We need to see that there is danger in our world, and that this danger is not only from without, but it's also from within, from our own sinful natures, with which with the devil want us to think much more grandly about ourselves than we actually should. This may be good for us to know, but it is not fun for us to know. It is humbling to be humbled. But we need this. We need to be shown by God how we really are compared to him and his law, so that he can then show us that even though on our own we are weak and are helpless, that God has not left us without a helper. Instead, the same triune God who has given us life caused the second person of the Trinity to be born as a man, who after living in a state of perfect humility for his entire life, allowed himself to be humbled even more as he was put in the place of sinners as he suffered and died on the cross for our sins. In this way, Jesus has atoned for all of our boastfulness, along with all of our other sins that we have committed against God and against other people. Without Jesus, we would not be precious to God, because as sinners, we could only be God's enemies. But through faith in Jesus, and through the forgiveness of sins which God gives to us through that faith, we are God's children. And we know that we are precious to God, because he gave his only begotten son to die for us, and then sat by, as, and, sat by and watched as Jesus suffered every agony of body and soul, so that we could be spared from these. You know how much something is worth by looking at the price tag, right? Well, your price tag says that you were worth one Jesus because that is what God paid so that each and every one of you could be freed from death and become his beloved child. And now that God has gone to the trouble of making you his child, don't think that he plans to let you run around exposed to any and all dangers. God our Heavenly Father is not nearly as bad a parent as that. Instead, God has told us in his word exactly how he sees to our well-being in both our bodies and souls. For our souls, to keep us not only believing in Jesus, but also strong in this faith, God has given us the means of grace, the word and the sacraments. These are the ways in which we are told about Jesus, and also through these words, we are given Jesus. Whenever you hear in church or on your own during the week, that who Jesus is and what he has done for you, through that hearing, the Holy Spirit is giving you faith in what you are hearing. And then especially in church, when you receive Christ's body and blood in the Lord's Supper, you are being given by Jesus that which he used his body and blood to earn, the forgiveness of your sins. Yes, it is true that we receive the Lord's Supper in remembrance of what Jesus did. But it is so much less of something that we're doing together as it is what Jesus is doing for us. This is because in the supper, Jesus is giving us himself by the power of his words, the same body and the same blood which hung on the cross in payment for our sins. So it is through these means, the word, baptism, which is how God first washed away our sins and marked us as his children and at the Lord's Supper, that God keeps us safe and strong in our faith so that we can withstand all the attacks and temptations of sin in this world. Through these, God keeps the promise that he has made to us in John chapter 10, that no one can snatch his children out of his hand. But we also know that God is not only concerned with our souls. He is also concerned with our bodies and lives. He wants to keep us safe. 
And to this end, we are told here and elsewhere in Scripture that God works through the servants of angels as his instruments of protection. We read in Psalm 34, The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And in Psalm 91, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And finally, in Hebrews chapter 1, Are they not all ministering spirits, sent out, to, sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? God has especially promised that his angels are watching out for children. And we know that they need protection, because try as we might as parents, we can never keep our children completely safe. For example, those of you who have been to my house know that we have a staircase heading down to the basement right when you walk in the door. Now, when Helen Baby started moving around, we realized that we needed a way to keep her from moving down those stairs. And so Marta and I bought one of those nice, heavy-duty metal gates, which installs into the walls with a swinging gate inside the frame. And this is really safe, as long as you remember to close it. And we try to keep it closed, and in fact, John reminds us almost insanely. But one time we forgot. I was sitting downstairs watching TV, obviously oblivious to the world, until I heard Marta gasp and run over the top of the stairs. Then Marta came downstairs holding Helen and told me that Helen had what she had just been doing. She had been sitting at the top of the stairs, playing with the open gate, just swinging it back and forth. Helen loves to propel herself off of cliffs. When she is on a couch or on a bed, her preferred way of getting off is just to crawl over to the edge and then keep on going until someone catches her. And you know, we always do catch her, so in her mind, this works. But we were not watching Helen this one time. She could have gone over the edge of the stairs. In fact, she should have gone over the edge of the stairs. And there was nothing to stop her except the hard, laminate-covered cement at the bottom. But even though Marta and I were not watching her at that time, we are sure that someone else was, namely her guardian angel. I'm sure that we all have memories like this of ourselves and our kids from our lives, where we can't figure out why something bad didn't happen when it definitely could or even should have happened. We will never know exactly why certain things do or don't happen in this life, but we do have God's promise that his angels are definitely involved in our lives, <laughs> watching over us and protecting us, even at times when we don't know we're in danger. Of course, as we think about God's protection and his preservation, we know that even though he has promised to protect us, that he has not promised to keep us alive in our bodies on this earth forever. At some point, unknown to us, we are all going to die. But our deaths don't mean that God's angels have failed us or that they're done working for us. Even when we die, God's angels are still with us. And, are, and when we die, when our souls leave our bodies, they bring it up to be with God in heaven so that we can finally see what they've been seeing all along. That is the absolute glory of seeing God. So even though we don't see them, angels are definitely part of our existence right now. They watch over us and protect us because they are God's servants and we are precious to God. Oftentimes they are protecting us from things that we didn't even know were there. Just as through the means of grace, God is protecting us from unseen spiritual dangers. And this is all to the end that we are kept safe, so that we can live lives of faith and service on this earth for as long as God wills it, until he finally takes us to be with himself and all of his saints and angels in heaven. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.